Hi, this is the math lesson for Monday the 26th and for the cohort 13 class. So today we're going to be talking about sound and the sound of sound and the speed of sound and in general how sound is used in physical therapy. So that's the start of today's lesson. So let's talk about sound. So we're going to talk about sound in the human body. We're going to talk about compressions and refractions. We're going to talk about decibels, natural frequency, constructive and destructive interference. Uh, what a beat is, doop, 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 right? And Doppler effect, and then some shock waves. And then we're going to literally talk about some PT applications of sound. So how does sound work? Well, let's say you're at your favorite concert. For me, it'd be a Slipknot concert. As the band plays music, Electrical signals will cause speakers to expand and contract, pushing waves of pressure out from their baffles. Those areas of compressed air are then received by external auditory meatus, your ear hole, go into your ear, causing your bones of hearing, right, to vibrate. It also causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. These vibrations are converted back into an electrical signal and interpreted as sound, or as some of you may think, as noise, depending upon your takes of different types of music. So all sounds originate in the vibration of some sort of material objects, whether that be, you know, metal, air, whatever it is, vibration is cause is what causes sound. So a source of all sound waves is vibration. In a piano, a piano, piano, lin, yeah, in a piano, lin, in a piano, violin or guitar, sound waves is produced by vibrating strings. And things like saxophones, the reed vibrates and a flute, a fluttering column of air at the mouthpiece vibrates. For me sitting here talking to you, right? My voice results from vibration of my vocal cords. I can change my voice by adjusting how those vocal cords react, right? What's literally happening in the case right now of you receiving my sound, my vocal cords are vibrating. Those vocal cords are going to a reverse baffle in my microphone. That microphone is converting my voice, the vibrations of my voice, into a digital signal. That digital signal is eventually gonna be encoded by my computer. That encoding is going to match up to my video signal that's occurring, which we'll talk about sight later on in physics, by my camera. All of that is gonna be encoded into one digital file. That digital file is then gonna be uploaded to YouTube. YouTube's gonna convert that down actually in sampling size from the original quality. Won't get into that. And then you're going to play that video right now as you're watching it. As you're watching it, your computer itself is converting my voice, that's the digital signal, into electrical signals that cause speakers to vibrate in either your laptop or in my case, in your 501 surround sound speakers. As that causes that vibration to occur, those signals are gonna travel through the air and are gonna impact your ears. As they impact your ears, sleepies vibrate, all those fun things that your ears vibrate, you get a signal, you translate that signal into my voice. How each of you hear my voice, right, is transcribed by the vestibular cochlear nerve. That's gonna send the signal to your brain, and your brain's gonna interpret that as Mr. McKeever's voice. My voice sounds different to every person. We all have a different opinion of how sounds occur. Um, the real irony is if you ever listen to yourself, right, the way you hear yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, the way you hear yourself is totally different than the way you think you speak. I don't know how you guys survive listening to my voice. Like I listen to some of the recordings and I'm like, oh my God, do I really sound that nasal? I sound like I've got two nose plugs up my nose the whole time I'm talking to myself. To my, in my own head, I don't sound that way. Um, I don't know how I sound to myself, but I definitely don't sound that way. So, you know, sound is a little bit subjective is what I'm saying. So in the case of large, original vibration, stimuli the vibration is something larger or more massive, right? The sounding board of an instrument, the air column within the reed or the wind instrument, the air in the throat or the mouth of a singer. Some singers have the ability to really project their voice in a different manner. Um, there's a group that I, I listen to frequently that's Ginger and they're out of the Eastern Bloc of Europe. And when you see the female singer and she starts singing, her voice produces one way. Later on in the song, it's a totally different voice. So people can change the way they sing, right? 
the vibrating material sends the disturbance to a surrounding medium, air in this case, in the form of longitudinal waves. The wave frequency and the sound that produces equals the frequency of the vibrating source. So we describe our subjective impression of the frequency of sound by the word pitch. So subjectively, pitch is the term we use. A high pitched sound sounds like that from like a piccolo or a high vibration object. A low pitch sound sounds like something from a foghorn. It has a low vibration frequency. A very young person like most of you can hear pitches from as low as about 20 hertz to so about 20,000 hertz. As we grow older, our hearing range shrinks, especially at the high frequency end. And actually, it's the low frequency as we get damage. So if you've ever had that friends like, oh, I can hear a dog whistle. No, you can't. Um, dogs have a lot higher hearing in the hundred thousands of hertz. We are not there. We can get to about 20,000 hertz. Sounds of frequencies below 20 hertz are called infrasonic. Sounds of frequencies above 20,000 hertz are called ultrasonic. We'll talk about soon about ultrasound in the PT world using either one megahertz or three megahertz frequencies. So one million hertz or three million hertz. And no, patients don't hear the ultrasound machine. I've had patients tell me that before. I can hear that thing vibrating. Mm, no, you can't. We cannot hear either infrasonic or ultrasonic sounds, right? Dogs can hear a frequency of 40,000 or more up into like the 100,000. Like bats definitely can go over 100,000 hertz. Bats and certain animals operate and move by echolocation. As the source of a sound vibrates, a series of compressions and refractions travel outwards from that source. So as you clap your hands, a pulse of sound goes out in all directions. Each particle is moved back and forth along the direction of the expanding wave. A compression travels along the spring, much like a sound wave travels in the air. So when you open and close the door, it is an excellent example of a compression refraction. So say you have a door, you have like my office right now and I have my window open. When I open my door, there's compression that's gonna travel across the room. When the door is closed, a rare fraction or a compress an area of low pressure is going to go travel across the room. For a wave in motion, it's not the medium that travels across the room, but it's the pulse that travels. In both these cases, the pulse travels from the door to the curtain. We know this because in both cases, the curtain moves after the door is open or closed. When I open the door, the compression is going to travel across the room and push the window, the curtain out. When I close the door and create that area of low pressure, it's going to draw the curtain in. So you can think about this when you quickly open a door, you can imagine the door pushing molecules next to it into its neighbors. Those neighboring molecules then push into their neighbors and so on, and that compression wave moves along like a spring. Pulse of compressed air moves from the door to the curtain, pushing the curtain out of the way. This pulse of compressed air is called a compression. So when we speak, we have pulses of compressed air. That's how we speak. When you quickly close the door, the, neighboring, the door pushes the neighboring air out of the room. It creates an area of low pressure next to the door. Well, we know that areas of high pressure tend to trend, travel to areas of low pressure. So what happens at that point is those molecules try to fill in that area or zone of low pressure. So that results in this low pressure pulse moving toward, from the curtain to the door, and that's called a rare fraction. That's that curtain blowing in. So on a much smaller but more rapid scale, this is what happens when a tuning fork is struck or when a speaker produces music. The vibrations of the tuning fork and the wave it produces are constantly considerably higher in frequency and lower in amplitude than the case of the swinging door. You don't notice the effects of a sound wave curtain on the or sound wave on a curtain, but you're aware of them when they meet your sensitive eardrums. So consider waves in a tube. When the prong of a tuning fork is struck next to a tube, the compression enters the tube. As that prong swings away, the opposite direction, a rare fraction follows compression. And that tuning fork is going to swing back and forth consistently as that occurs. Um, I'm trying to think, I've got a tuning fork somewhere here. I'm just not sure where it's at. Let me see where my tuning fork is. I'll find it then. So as that series of compressions and rarefractions are produced, you have areas of high pressure and areas of low pressure. 
That's what's going to go to your ear, and that's what you're going to translate into sound. I'm going to pause real quick. Let me see if I can find my tuning fork real quick. So I'm going to pause recording. All right, and I'm back. I found my tuning fork. That was kind of what I was looking for. So here we have a regular old good style tuning fork. Well, you may ask, what do you use this for, Mr. McKeever? I can use it for checking patients' hearing. You can also use it for testing for fractures. But in the meantime, when I strike this tuning fork, the tuning fork's gonna vibrate back and forth, as you can see. As that tuning fork is vibrating back and forth, it's sending areas of low pressure and high pressure out away from it. When I move that closer to my ear, I can hear it a lot better, right? So if I strike it down here, you guys can probably hear the ting. Hold on. There's a nice ting, right? But you can't really hear the vibrations until I move it closer to the music back, the microphone back. And then you might hear it a little bit. I hear it a lot when I bring it to my ear. We could actually do this in that little tube and you would actually be able to move, put a small piece of paper or a cloth at the end of the tube and you would see that cloth vibrating in and out as the sound travels from the tuning fork down the tube. So sound travels in solids, liquids, and gases. Most of the sound you hear are transmitted through the air. You put your ear, ear to a metal fence and have a friend tap it far away. The sound is transmitted louder and faster by the metal than by the air. Click two rocks together underwater while your ear is submerged. You'll hear the clicking very sound very clearly. Solids and liquids are generally good conductors of sound. Excuse me. The speed of sound then differs in different materials. In general, sound is transmitted faster in liquids and gases and still faster in solids. So if we had to rank them, gases, liquids, solids for transmitting things, and ultimately plasmas theoretically would have the fastest transmission of sound, but we don't really transmit sound in plasma. Now sound itself cannot travel in a vacuum, right? The transmission of sound requires a medium. So there has to be something there to expand and contract, right? And if it's in a vacuum, meaning space, there is nothing to expand and contract. So the speed of sound in a gas depends upon the temperature of the gas and the mass of the particles of the gas. The speed of sound in a material depends on the material's elasticity. If you watch a distant person hammering, the sound of the blow takes time to reach your ears. So you often see the blow, then you hear it. But in the case of something like thunder and lightning, Right? You hear the thunder after you see the lightning because the lightning is traveling at the speed of light versus the speed of sound. These experiences are evidence that sound is much slower than light. And this is why any of your favorite space battle movies, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, any of those, right? The actual battles themselves are a little bit fake because right, you see two Star Destroyers coming at each other and they're shooting each other. You're pew, 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 pew. In reality, there would be no sound like that. Like space battles would be the most boring battles in the world because maybe inside the ship you would hear the gun firing, but once it's outside the ship, there's no sound. There's no air to move, right? So it would just be, right? The explosions would make no sounds. There'd be no loud booms. There's no air to move. Right, so these experience evidence, right? We can see the lights explosion, everything like that. It's, we were watching those space battles, but we wouldn't be able to hear anything at all. The speed of sound in dry air at zero degrees Celsius is about 330 meters per second, or about 1,200 kilometers per hour. To put that in perspective, this is about a millionth the speed of light. Increased temperatures increase the speed slightly making it faster, moving molecules bump into each other more often. For each degree increase in an air temperature above zero Celsius, the speed of sound increases by about 0.6 meters per second. So in the average area, you know, so for example, I'm going to use my computer as an example here right now. So my computer, I'm looking at it, is running about 45 degrees Celsius, right? So because it's running 45 degrees Celsius, the ambient air te temperature inside my uh, computer is about 45 degrees Celsius, right? So times 0.60. So 
So that technically means inside my computer, sound is traveling at about 357 meters per second. So I took 45 times 0.6 and added it to 330. Not a huge change, right? But it's still a change. So we usually typically use about 330 meters per second as our normal average speed of sound. Speed of sound also depends upon the mass of the particles. Lighter particles such as hydrogen molecules and helium molecules move faster and transmit sound much more quickly than heavier gases such as oxygen and nitrogen, which make up most of our atmosphere. Speed of sound in solid materials depends upon not only the material's density, so how dense it is, but on its elasticity. Elasticity is the ability to change shape and respond to an applied force and then resume its initial shape. Steel itself is very elastic. This this thing here, example, right, the squish ball is much like putty, very inelastic. When I hit it, sound does not travel through it very well. Sound travels about 15 times faster in steel than air and about four times faster in water than air. So if you go back here and we know that air is about 330 meters per second, we multiply it times four, right? So at that point, you know, we're talking about 1500 meters per second in water than in the air. So how far is away a storm if you know a three second delay between lightning flash and the sound of thunder? Well, for the speed of sound in air, about 340 meters per second, figure out a certain temperature. We know that 340 meters per second times three seconds will be about a thousand meters or one kilometer away. The time of light is negligible since the storm is only about one kilometer away. So for about every three seconds, most times that a thunderstorm is occurring, that's about a one kilometer distance from where that lightning strike was. I remember when I grew up, we used to say for every second it was a mile away. Well, that's vastly incorrect, right? So about a kilometer for every three second delay. Sound intensity is objective and it's measured in, by instruments. Loudness on the other hand is a physiological sensation sensed in the brain. The intensity of sound is proportional to the square of the amplitude of a sound wave. Loudness, though, differs for different people, although it's related to sound intensity, right? The unit of intensity for sound is decibels, named after Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, right? But loudness itself is really not that objective. I hear things differently than you would hear things. Maybe when I'm playing my music, you might think it's too loud. My neighbors may think it's too loud. To myself, it may be very low to me. Right now in my house, I know for a fact, my air conditioner to me is loud. I've gotten used to it though. I have accommodated to the sound of my air conditioner. But when I have friends over, they're like, man, how do you survive with this air conditioner? And I checked my, my Apple watch has one of those decibel meters. And actually, let's see, got my little decibel meter here on my phone. So let me break it out. So hold on here. So DB meter. So your phones have a decibel meter in them. You can actually use them. Uh, yeah, whatever. Hold on here. So right now in my house, if I don't speak, because as soon as I speak, my volume goes up. My air conditioner is about 55 decibels. As I speak, I can increase the decibel meter up above 80, right? But as a whole, I'm running about, you know, 55 decibels, right? Intensity is that. That is the intensity of the sound around me. That's how much pressure is being pushed upon me, right? It may not seem that loud to me because I'm used to it at this point, but it may be loud to you if you were in my house. Starting with a zero at the threshold of normal hearing to an increase of 10 decibels means sound intensity has increased by a factor of 10. A sound of 10 decibels is 10 times as intense as a sound of zero decibels. 20 decibels is not at the, is not twice as strong as 10 decibels, but 10 times as intense as 10 decibels, or 100 times as intense as a threshold of hearing. 60 decibels is 100 times more intense than a 40 decibel sound, so it constantly goes up on a logarithmic scale. 
So looking at the sound levels here, um, let me bring this up one second here. My computer's freezing up. Hold on one second. I'm going to pause recording. Okay, sorry about that. Evidently, somebody's trying to send me a request to talk on a computer, and I just didn't know what to do with it. So I'm back. So this is looking at the decibel levels here, right? So again, zero is the threshold of hearing. That is as low as you can hear, right? So as we go up, normal breathing, 10 degrees, close whisper, 20 decibels, right? 40, library, normal speech about 60, right? I, you could see, let me start this again here. So again, you're seeing, as I start speaking, it goes up into the 80s, right? And why is that going up into the 80s? Well, because it's taking the ambient noise of my air conditioner plus my voice as well. Busy traffic street, about 70. Average factor, about 90. Subway train, 100. Loud rock music, 115. Threshold of pain is about 120 decibels. The jet engine at 30 meters. So quite a distance away is 140 decibels. Right? So that's pretty interesting to look at, right? So decibels are what we're looking at there. So hearing damage begins at about 85 decibels. So I still have this thing running here on my, my phone, right? I can get it up to 80, close to 85 decibels with the loudness of my voice. And the microphone should be adjusting for my loudness, hopefully. But, you know, that's long-term damage. If you spend a lot of time at those, at 85 decibels, you can end up damaged. It corresponds to the length of exposure and frequency characteristics. A single burst of sound produces vibrations tense enough to tear apart the organs of core teeth, the receptor of your organs in the ear. Less intense but severe noise can interfere with cellular process in organs and cause eventual breakdown. Unfortunately, the cells of these organs do not regenerate. Earplugs can notably reduce the, and protect your hearing, can reduce noise levels by about 30 decibels. I think there's a company called Eargasm. It's one of the really good companies for making hearing protection, especially if you're somebody like me that goes to concerts frequently. Even though I used to go to concerts and not wear any form of hearing protection, I've learned, um, for example, in October, I've got a concert I'm going to, which is Judas Priest and Sabaton down in Phoenix. Now, I could very well go to that concert and not wear hearing protection. And then for the next three days, I'm going to find out I can't hear because I'm getting old. You guys may go, have no problem whatsoever, come home and have hearing you know, in a few hours. My ears don't recover as fast as I used to because I'm getting older, right? Take, for example, something like a concussive blast in the military, right? A concussive blast is going to cause two things. Well, number one, there's going to be that force applied as that blast goes out. But also that sound wave that goes out and propagates from that is just as damaging, right? We know that the person's probably going to lose hearing and have hearing damage from that single blast of intense noise, but the other thing that we don't think about is the way that sound wave propagates through the brain and through all the organs, that can cause long-term damage as well to the body because of that intense sound wave, right? So that can be really dangerous to people. And we've had many, many soldiers come back that may be fine structurally, right? But they've suffered some really, really bad traumatic brain injuries as occurrence of these explosions. And it's really sad because even to this day, we're just now starting to realize the impact of concussive damage on people's brains, right? And where that's actually a totally different subject when we get into talking about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is repetitive concussive damages to the brain. So when an object composed of elastic material is disturbed, it vibrates at its own specific set of frequencies, which together form a specific sound. You drop a wrench in a baseball bat on the floor, you hear distinctly different sounds, right? If I drop this, it has one sound. If I drop this, it has a different sound. If I drop my tuning fork so it doesn't land on my phone, it has a different sound, right? Objects have a different sound. And all of those are striking a, a soft pad on my desk. So none of them are making the original sound. If I had a hard floor, I could drop it on that one and make a different sound. We speak of each object's natural frequency, the frequency at which an object vibrates when it's disturbed. Natural frequency depends upon the elasticity and shape of the object. Even your body has a very specific natural frequency. Some of you may have encountered it if you've ever been to a concert and the concert hits specific notes as it's going through and you feel your whole body kind of tingle. 
typically that's your body reacting in its natural frequency. The natural frequency of small bells is higher than at a big bell and rings at a different pitch. Most things, planets, atoms, almost everything in between have a springiness and vibrate at one or more natural frequency. A natural frequency is, is one, or natural frequency is one at which minimal energy is required to produce forced vibrations and the least amount of energy required to produce vibration. Sometimes you may have done this on, if you've ever had, it's not a good example, but if you had a glass, right? And you were able to run your finger around the glass and it was crystal. You can actually cause that crystal to vibrate its natural frequency and it allows it to continue because it'll continue humming for a while. Sounding boards are an important part of stringed instruments because they're forced into vibration and produce the sound. An unmounted tuning fork makes faint sound. If I strike a tuning fork while holding its base on the tabletop, so now I've got this, you can't see it, but I've got the tabletop, this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch my tabletop, right? It causes the tabletop to be forced to vibrate. If I strike it somewhere else, I can make different sounds. Right? It causes things to be into forced vibration. Forced vibration occurs when an object is made to vibrate by another vibrating object that is nearby. The vibration of guitar strings in an acoustic guitar would faint if they weren't transmitted by the guitar's wooden body. Without that sounding board, the sound of the guitar strings makes is barely audible. An object resonates when there's force to pull it back and forth from its starting position, enough energy to keep it vibrating. If the frequency of force vibration matches the object's natural frequency, resonance dramatically increases the amplitude of these waves. If you pump a swing in rhythmic and rhythm with the swing's natural frequency, you start going higher and higher, right? Timing is more important than force at which you pump. Even small pumps or pushes in rhythm with the natural frequency of the swing motion produces large amplitudes of swinging. If two tuning forks are adjusted to the same frequency and striking one fork, right? If I strike one fork and I've got one of the same frequency beside it, the actual compressions or refractions will cause the other fork itself to vibrate at the same frequency. Um, I think this tuning fork is what, I don't know what its Hertz level is. That doesn't say on it. I think this is 128 coulombs, maybe. I'm not have to find out. Frequency of these pushes matches the natural frequency of the fork. So if the pushes increase the amplitude and the fork's vibration, as those forks start to vibrate, it causes the other one to vibrate more. And so they kind of repeatedly push each other back and forth to cause that vibration. And you get a little bit of resonance going on. So the first compression gives the fork a tiny fork, a bend. The fork bends, the fork returns to its initial position, it keeps moving back and forth and overshoots. And you get this cycle of it back, bending back and forth, causing these compressions and refractions. If the forks are not adjusted for match frequency, the timing of the pushes will be off and resonance will not occur. So like in your car, if you tune a radio and you're adjusting the natural frequency of the electronics to many of the incoming signals, right now, there are, God only knows how many radio frequencies passing through you. If somehow you were able to adjust your brain to those frequencies, you could actually hear the radio without a radio. Not weird, it's good. Right? But as you turn that little knob, piezoelectrics come into effect and it receives signals from the incoming air and it tunes to your favorite station, right? If you want to listen to Comp 92, you adjust it to 92.3 and you'll be able to hear the sound. Resonance occurs whenever successive impulses are applied to a vibrating object in rhythm. In Tacoma, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse was caused by resonance. When force was produced a force that was resonated with the natural frequency of the bridge, the amplitude kept increasing until the bridge collapsed. So this is kind of what it looked like as the winds went through, and it literally caused the bridge to collapse from sound. This also happened in West Virginia, and it happened in a couple of different other places where they didn't think that the wind would be ever enough to cause the natural frequency of the bridge to occur, but it did, and it caused the bridge to collapse. When constructive interference occurs, when sound waves are working together in junk conjunction with each other. So when those sound waves work together, constructive interference occurs. That means the listener hears a louder sound. 
When destructive interference occurs, the listener hears a fainter sound or no sound at all. Sound waves, like any waves, can be made to interfere with each other. For a sound, the crest of a wave corresponds to a compression, so the high point. The trough, the low part, is the is refraction. When the crest of the waves overlap the crest of another wave, there is constructive interference. When the crest of a wave overlaps the trough of another, there is destructive interference. So there's going to be this constant form of wave going like that. So both transverse and longitudinal waves display interference when they're superimposed. So here's two identical transverse waves in phase. They produce an increased amplitude wave. Right? So that means that if they're going in phase with each other, they produce an increased amplitude. If they're out of phase with each other, they create destructive interference. This is why it's so important when you're setting up a home theater to make sure you have your speakers just right, because you could create an area of dead space for yourself where you normally sit. And then the sound waves that are trying to reach you are not as loud as they could be. Right? You need those speakers at a certain distance, so those waves travel at similar foie forms. So when they reach you, they create constructive interference and you can hear the sound at a lower volume. A listener equally distance from two sound speakers that trigger an identical sound wave to constant force hears a louder sound. The waves add together because their compressions and refractions arrive in phase. If the distance between speakers and the listener differs by half a wavelength, refractions from one speaker may arrive at the same time as compressions from the other and it may cause destructive interference. Right? You may have to adjust. You may, that's why a lot of receivers, you know, those stereo receivers you get for your sound, for your, ther your home theater system, have these little kind of antennas that you're used to test and put in different areas of your house or in your living room or wherever you're setting it up or your home theater so that you can set the speakers at a certain distance so they arrive in phase with one another. Otherwise, they may arrive out of phase and they actually decrease the sound. So in A, right, the waves are arriving in phase. In B, the waves arrive out of phase and you get destructive interference. So this first one down here in the corner shows as these two waves come together, they get reinforced with one another. If they arrive out of phase like this one down here is, right, they cancel out each other and you get a lower sound or no sound at all. You've ever noticed in theaters where maybe like, especially if you're in a music theater, like um, Ham Music Hall down at UNLV, there are certain areas of the theater where there are no seats. Now, some of those areas are for wheelchairs, not talking about those areas, but there are other areas where there's a block where there seems to be, there could be more seats there, but there are no seats. Well, why are there no seats there? Because they know that area is an out of phase area. And if those sound waves traveling from whatever they're having in that music hall, concert, you know, opera, whatever, arrives there, it'll be way low and the person sitting there won't be able to hear it and won't be able to enjoy the music experience. So they have specific areas they kind of block up and say, no, we shouldn't put any seats there. Destructive interference with sound waves is usually not a problem. There's usually enough reflection of sound to fill in canceled spots. But again, sometimes dead spots occur in poorly designed theaters and gymnasiums. Reflected sound waves interfere with unreflected sound waves to form zeros or zones of low amplitude. The destructive sound is interference is known and used in anti-noise technology. So I'm going to use, for example, my headphones here. My headphones that I have in this case have active noise canceling. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but I'm sure you do. Some of you have probably the AirPod Pros or whatever. These are generic versions of that, right? They have little microphones on the outsides of the, the headphones. And those microphones pick up noise in your, your surrounding area. So right now, if I was to put those on, they would detect my air conditioning. What they're going to do is in my ear, send in a signal that is counter to the air around me. And that's gonna cancel out the noise around me so that I can maybe then only hear my iPhone playing music or listening to uh, uh, the, the, the podcast or listen to me, right? Teach a lesson. That's kind of how that technology works, right? Noise devices like jackhammers have microphones that sense noise to the headphones that the person's wearing that block out that noise, that really noisy jackhammer. Um, that's the way to keep people from getting hearing damage. 
cars, right? In automobiles, there are these things that do this, right? If you get in something like a newer Buick, especially, or a Lincoln, they have the quiet cabin interior, right? You get in those cars, and even if the stereo is off and you're just driving down the road, there are microphones monitoring the noise, the ambient noise in the actual cabin, and they're re sending out a signal from the speakers that cancels the road noise, right? So the human ear can't detect them at that point. Some cabins of airplanes are now quieted with this anti-noise technology as well, so that you don't hear the sound of the jet engines as you're going through space or through air, right? And that can be a good thing and a bad thing. I'm one of the person that I tend to like the noise of my engine, and I want to hear it, whereas, you know, some people don't. Some people want that noise cancellation to help them go, right? My stereo in my truck has that technology built in that it's not actually anti-noise canceling, so it doesn't cancel the road noise out. But as I get drive faster, it detects the increase in the engine of my noise, uh, engine noise, engine my noise, noise of my engine, and it increases the volume of my speakers, counter that. So if I'm listening to music, it increases it slightly. As I decrease and I slow down, it decreases it. So that maybe when I come to a stop, my speakers don't blow my eardrums out, right? So when two waves of slightly different frequency are sounded together, a regular fluctuation in the loudness of those combined sound is heard. When two tones of slightly different frequency are sounded together, the sound is loud and faint, then loud and faint, then loud and faint, and so on and so forth. The periodic variation in the loudness of noise is known as the beat. Beats can be heard when two slightly mismatched tuning forks are sounded together. There's going to be an area of destructive and constructive interference as that goes on. Beats can occur with any kind of wave and are a practical way to compare frequencies. To tune a piano, a piano tuner listens for beats produced between standards of a, a tuning fork and a particular string in the piano. When the frequencies are identical, the beat disappears. Members of an orchestra tune up by listening for beats between their instruments and a standard tone, right? That's kind of what the conductor's there for. This leads to this thing called the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is a change in frequency dependent upon movement and position of either the receiver or the producer. In the case of a sound, we hear this as a change in pitch. In the case of movement waves, such as ocean waves, we experience this as an apparent change in speed. We can use this phenomenon to measure things like the depth of a lake, for example, or in a human baby, or human terms, the size, shape, and appearance of a baby, right? We use Doppler and ultrasound. The Doppler also applies to light. Increasing in light frequency when the light sources approaches you, decrease in frequency when the light moves away from you, right? Star spin and the speed of the star can be determined by shift in movement when we observe them in the sky. Dopplers also affect light. Like I said, there's blue shift, an increase in frequency towards the blue end of the spectrum, and red shift, decrease in the wave frequency towards the red end of the spectrum. You know, rapidly spinning star shows a red shift on the side facing away from us and a blue shift on the side facing us. Shock waves are patterns of overlapping spheres that form a conical wave traveling at speeds, speed of sound. It consists of two cones, an area of high pressure generated by the bow of a supersonic aircraft, an area of a low pressure that follows that tail of the aircraft. It is not required that a moving object be noisy, right? An airplane traveling at supersonic speeds may not make much noise at all, right? But you'll hear a sharp crackling sound generated by that supersonic aircraft. That's why a lot of times, Planes are not allowed to go mock speed or greater than the speed of sound over cities because there's that rapid compression of sound that creates that sharp crackling noise. The intensity is due to overpressure and underpressure of atmospheric pressure between the two cones. Yeah, produced before it broke the sound wave. So example here, right? I've got a plane that's traveling at supersonic speed down here in the left-hand corner. It's pushing the air out in these two cones. But behind it, there's an area of super low pressure. Well, these two cones will crash together behind the plane and create that supersonic boom or crack that occurs behind a supersonic plane. This can occur with supersonic bullets. It can also occur with the crack of a circus whip that's, if you can get them going fast enough. So how do we use that sound in physical therapy? Well, we use it in a couple different ways, right? Primarily in ultrasound. 
Ultrasound uses all the concept of sound to do both thermal and non-thermal effects on the body, right? With ultrasound, depth of penetration, so how far the ultrasound goes into the body, is inversely proportional to the frequency of ultrasound. So that means the lower the frequency in ultrasound, the deeper the penetration of tissue. So one megahertz ultrasound, because two are one or three megahertz, one goes deeper than three megahertz. Two separate frequencies commonly used on shunt again are one and three megahertz. There are some machines out there that use two or three or 3.3, kind of rare, right? So 3.3 penetrates about one centimeter deep, whereas one megahertz penetrates about five centimeters deep. So that's a, quite a difference in penetration, especially when you think of something like the arm or you know the shin or something like that. Thermal effects can partially be nullified by adjusting the duty sound of the ultrasound. The duty cycle ref refers to both a continuous or a pulse cycle. So whether the sound waves are going constantly or they're shutting off and turning on and shutting off and turning on. A continuous ultrasound, so sending waves continuously through the human body will produce a warming of the tissue because the vibrations are gonna cause the tissue to vibrate at a high frequency and that will warm up the tissue. So we know that a 3.3 megahertz penetrates only about as fifth as far as one megahertz, but it has four times the heating potential because of the frequency at which it's going to hit that tissue. Pulsed ultrasound is typically then listed in percentage as a beam function. So 20%, 10%, 30%, 40%, whatever. The lower that pulse frequency, the lower the thermal effects. So for example, if you have a 20% pulsed ultrasound, the ultrasound itself is only on for 20% of the time and is off for 80% of the time. So if you have it on for 10 seconds, it's only sending sound waves for about two seconds and then it's off for another eight, right? So pulse is gonna have a lower chance of heating up the tissue because it doesn't affect that tissue for as long a period of time. The intensity of ultrasound though is measured in watts per centimeter squared. Probably the most common intensity you're gonna encounter in the clinic is 1.8 watts per centimeter squared. You might ask me, well, why Mr. McKeever? And no one particularly knows why we use 1.8 watts per centimeter squared. It just kind of has been the standard that we use in the field. Um, I don't like that. We're gonna teach you proper ways to know this. And that is part of the difference between a PTA and a tech is knowing when to use what frequency and when to use what intensity. So what do we use ultrasound for? Well, we can use it for soft tissue shortening when the patient has a contracture or a contracted muscle. We can use it for pain control, for dermal ulcers, surgical skin incisions, tendon injuries, bone fractures. We can use it for phonophoresis, the transdermal delivery of medication. We can help reabsorb calcium deposits when the patient has something like spurs. We can use it for plantar warts, or we can use it for herpes zoster. There are a bunch of different ways that we can use ultrasound. Why might we not use ultrasound? Well, you're gonna find with a lot of the modalities we use in the physical therapy world, malignant tumors or cancers are gonna be our major contraindication. Well, why? Well, because a cancer grows based upon the energy it receives. So if you deliver more energy to that cancerous tumor, it's going to grow at a faster rate. That's why we don't typically deliver energy to a tumor, otherwise we might end up with bigger problems where the tumor gets worse. We're not gonna use it over certain tissues, like over the pregnant uterus. Again, baby is a rapidly growing pile of cells. You can almost think of baby as a malignant tumor in mommy. If you provide that with more energy, potentially that growth could be either stunted or accelerated based upon what kind of energy you deliver. We're not gonna do it over CNS tissue, so not, not over nerves, right? Not can do it over the eyes or reproductive organs. That kind of makes sense. You got to watch doing ultrasound over joint cement or plastic hardware that can damage it. Definitely over pacemakers. Sound waves can interfere with electrical signals. Or with somebody that's got thrombophlebitis where they're getting constant kind of blood clots in their veins. How can this also, and this is the assessment questions, but how could this also apply to you guys? Well, in the case of something, I'm going to use a simple case that I use here in my house, and that's Wi-Fi, right? All of us use wireless fidelity, right? Or Wi-Fi in most of our houses. My phone right now is connected to my internet via my Wi-Fi router. 
my Wi-Fi router has two different frequencies. It has 2.4 and 5.0 gigahertz, right? Well, why is that important to know? Well, five gigahertz is gonna transmit the data a lot faster, right? I'm gonna get a lot more throughput because it has a wider frequency to transmit the data, which is great. It means my speeds are up. It means that I can load Facebook twice as fast on my phone as you know, if I'm on five gigahertz versus 2.4. There's a downside to that, though, because we know with ultrasound, the shorter the wavelength, the better the penetration, meaning it travels farther. A five gigahertz wavelength doesn't travel as far. And the other thing a five gigahertz wavelength doesn't do is travel through really solid medium. My walls, I know you can barely see them here, but where they're around me are solid concrete. Like I'm in one of those old school apartments here that like, again, great for, you know, when it's keeping heat in, but man, when it gets summer, these walls bake up and heat up pretty cool, pretty quick, right? They also maintain things a lot, a lot more balance inside my own. But the downside to that is Wi-Fi doesn't travel very well through them. So something like a five gigahertz wavelength here in my office is great. But if I get out to my living room, that five gigahertz wavelength, it's not so great anymore because the walls are restricting it a little bit. Right? So we may not get as good of a signal out there as I get when I'm back here on the five gigahertz. So I have the 2.4 gigahertz band because I may get a little bit less speed on that two gigahertz, but the actual quality of the signal is much better, which means I don't experience as many drops in my signal when I'm on that bandwidth. The router that we use in school is 2.4 gigahertz router because that router that's sitting above the classroom gives signal to the entire class or the entire building of the PTA suite, which goes all the way over to OTA and all the way back to us. If we had a five gigahertz router, it may not travel all the way to the far side of the OTA suite. You know, for somebody as geeky as me, I don't like the fact that I have to be on Wi-Fi if I'm in my living room. So my living room is wired as well. So I have an actual route or I have a switch and I have a cable running all the way out through my apartment here, all the way out to my living room. So I can have wired internet in my living room as well. So when I move out there to do work, I can not be on a Wi-Fi signal, right? So there's all kinds of applications, not only in the physical therapy realm, but in general with pretty much everything else we deal with in our real world. So, you know, for those of you that maybe are having problems because you're like, man, my, my signal kind of sucks in here, in my office or my living room or whatever, Try checking your router and see if your router has the two gigahertz bandwidth. Because if it does, you may actually get better signal and better quality of your Wi-Fi by switching to that smaller, that 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth and get a better picture quality on something like observing a video from us here in you know, broadcasting or something like that. So that's it for this lesson. Uh, it wasn't a full hour and a half, it was about an hour. So that's good news. Um, you don't have to put up with me rambling for much longer on this. Let me take a look at our schedule here really quick because I think we're pretty much on par with where we should be. So cohort 13 schedule. So today is going to be the 26th. Yeah, so principles of sound we're supposed to be covering today and we hit sound, vibration, stuff like that. We're actually a little bit ahead of time. So what I will do is I appreciate you tuning into this lesson. I hope to see you on Monday, which is tomorrow at Anatomy Lab. And with that, this is Mr. McKeever signing off. Have a good rest of your day, and I will catch you at lab.